Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. And welcome back, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about something that pilots us, something that often gets a a bad rap, and it's just three letters, and it is your ego. What is the ego? I think you'll be fascinated when you hear what the definition is and how it supports us, maybe sometimes how it doesn't, and the the mis, misconception that many have about those three letters. We're going to dig into that. We're going into your mind today, uh, with your permission, of course, from an amazing psychologist, and she helps people all the time. She's an author. Uh, just so much insight we get from Dr. Ann Creekmore, who is back with us. Welcome. How are you doing today? Good, Steve. How are you doing? All right. Doing all right. Uh, the ego. We just say the, that word, and right away it conjures up potential negativity of somebody with an inflated view of themselves, but mm-hmm. not so much is what it is. Why don't we explain? How do you define the ego? Well, originally, um, Freud had these um, concepts that he shared about the personality, the parts of the personality, and that was the id, the ego, and the superego. And, of course, um, things evolve over time. But to define what he was saying uh, was that the id was kind of our base impulses, you know, our primitive impulses, our just desires. Um, And then our uh, ego was our mediator between our just, you know, desires and our superego. Our super ego being, in a sense, your conscience, you know, your uh, higher values, and that the ego came to, you know, so you have to, you know, at, he was going from the idea that you have to uh, kind of tame your ego, you know, with the super ego, you're being socialized and you are in rules to conform and to contain yourself from acting out. And the ego comes along as your reality principle. The, uh, the id was the pleasure principle, you know, that you're born with desires. The super ego is your conscience to help you control your id or pleasure principle. And the development of the ego is your reality principle, where you kind of take into consideration your needs, and then, um, but then also the needs of society, if you will, or other people. And the ego balances you. It's, it's focused on reality, like how do you get your needs met in a healthy way? You know that works for society, not acting out just on desires. So this this came about for me in the realization of all the id and the ego, super ego. My friend's daughter, a senior in high school, delivered an an essay, and she just read the first paragraph. And there were other students uh, with her, all different topics. She won a scholarship, mm-hmm. small scholarship for this. Oh, and I nice. heard the first paragraph, and, and I was like, wow, all right, you know, I've heard uh-huh. those terms, but I never knew, you know, what they do. Is, can we look at it this way, my understanding, that one of these is the the angel on the shoulder, one of these is the devil on the shoulder, uh, one of them is maybe the voice of reason, um, to look at it that way, which one would be which? Well, I, if you're looking at Freudian, it would be sure. like, you know, uh, their base primitive uh, desires untamed would be the, I guess you could say the devil, you know, if you will, to put it in yours, the little devil saying, oh, I want this, I, I want that, you know. And then uh, the angel would kind of be your it could be your super ego. It could, you know, like, well, this is the highest principle, the moral principles, how you should behave. Um, and then the reality principle in between the reasoning judgment would be the ego to help you to mediate both of those, what you want and what, you know, you, sh- you know, your shoulds in life are. Hmm. Which one will get you into the most trouble? <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> um, Mm. Is it? I'm trying to remember if it would be the id or would it be the superconscious? Yeah. Well, and, and I wouldn't necessarily call it the superconscious or the uh, supraconscious. Um, 
subconscious, if we're going to define, would be more things that supposedly you don't really, you're not aware of. It's more your unconscious. Like mm-hmm. things maybe you internalize as a child or sure. uh, or up say if your parents were angry maybe you have tendencies to be angry or to see things a certain way or you were criticized as a child and you had this limiting belief that you're not good enough or whatever that be could be subconscious super conscious sometimes can be thought of as something related i would think to the super ego but almost might some people might call it your divine consciousness your sacred you know space your uh, something at a at a higher level so i would associate that with the more of the super ego although super ego i think according to Freud was mostly just rules of society that you're supposed to follow um does that make sense yeah uh, and, and and is it is it true that the the subconscious is responsible for 90 something percent of everything we do exactly your subconscious i mean it would have some of your wants and desires but it also has a lot of in a sense super ego to it if when we're talking like this or looking at it conceptually because it's a lot of what you internalize from your parents and your life experiences that you know you develop certain beliefs or you absorb the energy maybe negative energy from your uh, interactions in your environment as a child so it kind of has a combo of everything in it mm-hmm. and it is kind of dictating us because we don't even know what it is we don't know Really, it's kind of unconscious, and it's just who we are at a deep level, and we have to go there to try to understand it. I had a quick question, though. When you said you've read that article uh, or the first paragraph, and she won a scholarship, what was that? You know, what interest? Uh, I can tell what you're interested in, but what was? What did she say about it? What was her topic, or what was it that really piques your interest to bring this up? What had she written about in that paragraph exactly? It was more of the what motivates us to do certain things. And she did, and this is a senior in high school, she tied it to a a book, a female author, but um, there was you know a connection to um, physical desires in this. Yes. And I can't and the author of this book is not an old, you know, old, maybe within the last 10, 15 years, somewhere in that territory. Right. Um, right. But and I unfortunately I can't remember that's, that's good. all the players, meaning the you know, the id. I thought there was something called a superconscious. Um then then certainly the ego and how it all comes into play. And she did in just in the one uh, uh paragraph paint paint the picture of one being good, one being not so good, and you know, uh something riding on top of all of that. Right, right. Kind of, um, yes. Uh, And one of the things that comes to my mind is that uh, I think we've talked about the Enneagram before. Uh, I don't know if you you remember this, but in that, the egos, and some people use the word ego uh, as kind of the vices we absorbed, which would kind of be more toward the id, the primitive desire impulses, uh, actually relating, say, to the seven deadly sins, you know, that, uh, that we have these, that people generally have a chief or primary ego that, or vice or passion that will kind of corrupt us in a sense or control us that was, we're motivated by that, um, that isn't really our whole psychological space, which has got the positives, our own good, and, um, uh, uh, but it is something we have to deal with. And it would be things like anger. Or it would be lust, or it could be dominance. Is lust really the the um, seven deadly sin? Is the, is dominating, wanting to do that? Greed, um, mm. you know, sloth, you know, all those kind of things would be in those uh, in in your ego, considered ego or vice that you have to kind of realize, well, what are you motivated by? Also, you know, not just your thoughts, beliefs, but your passion, your emotion, and what is the underlying, um, you know, like say some people might be motivated uh, for approval, 
in, uh, and that their desire, though, is to be loved or that feeling that they aren't lovable. And then at, they do a lot of things to look good to other people, to be helpers, so that they can uh, get flattery, in a sense, or just, mm. you know, endorsement or appreciation. And so a lot of their behaviors around feeding that particular, quote, ego, the ego of um, the personality type would be two in the Enneagram, uh, if you take the Enneagram personality test. Um, but that would be uh, that be driven by that versus being just about life and what's happening in your life. Or the vanity ego. You want to look as vanity. You know, in that case, you want to look good to people. So it's not an authentic relationship who you are. It's just uh, acting a certain way to get um, approval. Do you think that out of all of this, the most impactful, I don't want to say most important, but most impactful would be the conscious. I'm sorry, the subconscious, because mm-hmm. we yes. don't know what it's doing. You know, we exactly. just kind of yes. scary it is it is because it's like what are we really motivated by and unless we're in therapy half the time we can't really you know we think we're relating to the current event happening in our life at that moment and really we're relating to our past we're like living into fantasy camp where these camera projections are overflowing our reality of the situation and we're reacting more to our past, our past traumas, or our beliefs or decisions we made on the past than we are to even being in our reality. So often things go awry in what's happening in the present because we're not in the present, actually. Mm-hmm. It's, we're subconscious. It, mm-hmm. It's almost unnerving to know that there's something controlling us we're controlling us but we can't exactly. control we can't control what is controlling us even though it's exactly us. exactly mm. it's a very good point and that's why it's so important versus like say you know try to think about other people's feelings and take a step back and try to then go contemplate or introspect and figure your own feelings of what is being triggered or what's going on with you or why you're doing it versus just coming out and think it's caused by something external or the interpersonal situation and get to more of what it is you need to work on yourself all the time, figure out, you know, how to create good in your life by working on yourself first. Mm. Mm -hmm. As much as I've learned about the subconscious, I still have question marks. So Uh what is the best way to, is there a way to take inventory of what's, programmed in your mind is there ever a way to know what you know there's lots going on there but for the most part um can you give me an example of what you mean so where we've talked before how the subconscious is piloted by uh those those traumas that we've gone through and there's different Mm -hmm. types of trauma there's the big t trauma you know major major situations um you know, could be the passing of somebody, could yeah. be an accident, mm-hmm. whatever. Then the little T traumas, which, you know, it, it could have been something somebody said to you as a kid, or you internalized it, or maybe maybe you got bullied, you know, on the playground. Yes. And, and it could have been once. Trauma, you yeah. know, just, yeah. yeah. But mm-hmm. all of that, you know, it, it seems like there's a full, you know, if it was a, uh, an old school folder of paper in there and each one represents, you know, s- stuff that we've gone through. It seems like there'd be a lot in, in your file, <laughs> you know, Absolutely. your subconscious file, right? Absolutely. Right. So it's really important to ask yourself, you know, when you're feeling a certain way about a situation, you know, to kind of identify what the real feelings are, you know, happy, sad, scared, angry, you know, variations of the feelings. And then think to yourself, well, when did I feel this way before? Growing up or in my life or, you know, and then what is this kind of bringing up for me, triggering for me, so that you can then, you know, take that out or maybe you got to grieve something, you know, it's just triggering something that's you're ang- in the anger phase of grief about and you're angry now at the current situation with somebody. It's not even that. It's something from the past that you just never got past anger into feeling sad and grieving and getting it, you know, freeing yourself of it, releasing it. Hmm. Um, 
So you can ask yourself you know, associations as to what. Um, there's a technique where John Gray has couples, the one who wrote Men Are From Mars, One Men Are From Venus, where it has, he calls it love letters. It's like if you're upset with somebody, go write a love letter to them, but it's not a romantic love letter. It's just a letter saying your feelings. I feel sad because, I feel scared because, I feel shocked because, I feel embarrassed because, I feel rejected because. You fill in the blank in your mind. And then they ask yourself, well, what would make me feel good? And a response, an apology letter. Well, what do I need? Like uh, them to say, I'm sorry because of this and you deserve this. I understand this, you know. And then you can get to the deeper of what it is that's really bothering you. And then you can take it even deeper to heal emotional wounds of the past and go in and say, well, when did I feel this way before? You know, I, I've clarified what my emotions are, but where, you know, when did I first feel this way? Like how much of this is actually due to the present little argument we had about the dinner well, versus did it go all the way back to childhood dinners, you know, and what I felt, you know, then and the hurt or something I felt then. And then that would be more an internal trauma healing, grief, grieving kind of thing to work on versus something to actually talk about in the current situation. For sure. And and you bring back a memory that I did a timeline regression through hypnotherapy. And Uh essentially the practitioner said, think of, it it was, it was to uh, work on five negative emotions. So sadness, Mm -hmm. pick one of those. And you think back to the first time, the first time in your life you felt sadness and mm. took some time, you know, going back in my mind, you know, was it then? I'm not really sure. Then it was almost as if, you know, with your eyes closed and you're viewing a timeline that the practitioner got me to go above it a little bit and then move back a little bit further and come back down again. Just a visual. Uh-huh. And uh-huh. You know, I thought, of, you know, I, I think I had it. Um, but the result is once you work on it, it wipes out all the other feelings of sadness throughout your entire life. Right, right. Doesn't mean that you're not going to feel sad again, but from from the present all the way back should be gone, almost to the point where um, I my analogy is the timeline is somebody standing on a rug and you go and you pull a rug from underneath them. Exactly. And it indicates. Right. And, and do you know that, Steve, that Scientology originally, you've heard of Scientology and that, that they have a lot of around being a cult, et cetera. But Scientology, actually the core of it, before it kind of got into more of the organizational piece, you know, um, was that. They just wanted you, that's all it is. It just was a, an encounter with what they called an auditor where you sat with somebody and the symptoms you're having, the things that, big things, that they give a good example, a girl who almost drowned when she was like seven and her father pulled her out of the swimming pool. Well, they just basically had her, you know, she's looking at, well, why is she so dependent and why is she so afraid of water or whatever it was? I can't remember. Sure. But basically it went back to the first original mm. memory of being actually drowning in the, in the pool Oof. and thing, hearing things like some people calling, she's going to drown. She can't breathe. And, and all that coming up and always triggered and running through her mind and her father pulling her out and saving her. So, you know, she's got this dependency fear about not being without him. And that was the kind of thing that originally before it progressed and still I'm sure is the basis of it um, was just to help people go back to what they call it. They called it the basic, basic. Just like you're saying, the basic, basic memory, like you're go, trying to go back to your original memory. And then once you get to that original memory, memory, then it ends up healing all the uh, preceding memories that were just kind of layers or reenactments of it. Wow. And that's essentially, too, very Freudian. You know, the unconscious, the whole idea of psychoanalysis was that to just let the person come in, lay on the couch, right? Start talking about associate, free association, as they called it, you know, things coming up till they got to these unconscious, you know, experiences and beliefs and emotions and then could express them, release them and understand them, you know, with the reality principle in the sense, you know, um, and, uh, 
And so, yeah, it was so it would get into that deep subconscious, unconscious layer and would heal all the, the other later experience. Wow. There's <laughs> so much that we've gone through in our lives that is just sitting inside that needs to be addressed. Um, Absolutely. Why should we argue with anyone? We've got plenty of things to heal and hope. hope and we won't help us anyway. We've got to heal ourselves. It almost, <laughs> in, in a way, in a way, it almost amazes me that we function the way we do and move forward to some great degree, considering all we're dealing with. You know, all exactly. we, we've dealt with, you know, over the years. And it's, it's a, could you imagine if every one of us in a perfect world were able to address those traumas from our past, work on them, eradicate them, work through them, yes. whatever, what, what our lives would be like? Absolutely. That's why, really, for us to just spend the time taking care of ourselves, nurturing ourselves, you know, getting some time in the day, my body, spirit, spending time for in our own meditation, our own contemplation, our own healing, our own getting ourselves up to feelings of good and loving ourselves. And mm. just, we can just spend our time doing that and you know, then take care of the basic responsibilities of life and everybody be doing better instead of arguing on projecting out their anger at something, you know, that probably is, goes just to a past to, they have nothing to do with. Mm-hmm. Mm. So final thoughts on the, on the subconscious. Um, what do you think is, is one of the you know, top two modalities to know what's going on in your subconscious and to work with them? Well, I think we brought them up today. One, of course, so, well, or maybe three even now, um, doing, um, you know, our own personal contemplation, you know, and just being with our thoughts, meditation, just seeing what flows through, what sure. comes up, um, and, you know, owning our own stuff. When we get upset or angry, not thinking about the current, but trying to go within to see where it comes from, we can do that just on our own through associations and contemplation, meditation, but also through therapy, psychotherapy, mm. like you're saying, and then the regression hypnosis type where, you know, that you're going back to the times yeah. and anything that has you kind of look back and heal would be, you know, grief work. Um, those are some that I would think of. Yeah. And any others you think of? Uh, the hypnotherapy for me was impactful. Um, uh-huh. Energy healing, of course. But even before yes. all of that, you know, traditional uh-huh. talk therapy to uh-huh. just kind of get a baseline, a feel. You know, that to me, that's the foundation. And then this other stuff sits on top of it. Uh, exactly. And yeah, there's a whole field of um, psychology or type of therapy called psychodynamic therapy. Uh, and kind of based on psychoanalysis, Freudian, that is just focuses on just bringing up the past, too. Mm-hmm. So, and by the way, there's a great chapter in your book, Love Your Life, Love Yourself, about feeling your feelings. And that's what I believe you're talking about with just right. meditating, thinking, and, and feeling the feeling that's in your subconscious. And then knowing from there, you got to deal with it um, and move your life forward. How do we find you? What's, what's the best way to, to locate you? And the easiest way is just, um, well, you can find me too on, so I never mentioned this, but on Psychology Today, um, you just look me up. A lot of people find me for therapy that way on Psychology Today. Um, it has a directory of a lot of therapists you can get in touch with. But my own website is psychologistinvirginia.com, all spelled out with plural psychologistinvirginia.com. It's got my numbers and all about my therapy and everything sure. in it. And, and also details about uh, about your books too. Uh, exactly. Great, yeah. great talking with you today. Thanks for unpacking this. It's yeah. a, we've been a little deeper okay. today, but it is. Thank you. It's, it's it it what's it's what drives us. So we should we should know about it. Uh, oh, it's wonderful. Thank you yeah. for all your insights well, and thank getting you. us to focus on that. And we'll mm-hmm. talk soon. Okay. Hey, yes. Thanks. Hi, I'm Dr. A. P. Filosa. For the past 40 years, I've been a licensed clinical psychologist in practice, and I would like to invite you to my book, Love Yourself, Love Your Life. It contains all the primary causes and cures for all mental and emotional illnesses and 
issues and problems in living. So please know there is hope. You can find my book, Love Yourself, Love Your Life, in bookstores and Amazon and other online vendors. Please feel free, if I can help, uh, to call for a consult at 804-741-2608. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. Hey, Dad, how do airplanes fly? What's in this box? Can I touch this? Where does sand come from? Is this tree good for climbing? What happens if I mix these two things together? How are babies made? What does this thing do? Kids are curious about everything, including guns. Talking to them about gun safety in your home is a good first step, but you can do more. Always keep your guns locked, unloaded, and stored separately from ammunition. Storing your guns securely is the best way to prevent family fire, including unintentional shootings. For more information on safe gun storage and ways to keep your family safe, visit endfamilyfire.org. That's endfamilyfire.org. What do we keep in the attic? What's this thing called? Can I ride my bike backwards? Like I said, kids are curious. It's up to us to keep them safe. Brought to you by N Family Fire, Brady, and the Ad Council.